All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. Again, the link to sign in uh, is in the chat, if you wouldn't mind just taking a, a little bit of time to get to get signed in for today. Um, today, we are in session five of the ISTE standards for students taking a deep dive into those. Uh, and today, we're going to be looking at computational thinker, uh, what, it, what it means to be a computational thinker for students. Um, we are uh, just kind of like last week, uh, I know that right now time is is the most important thing that you have right now. And so I do not want to spend too much of that. I want to make sure that you guys um, are, <coughs> excuse me, are given some information uh, that you might find useful just to better understand what the ISTE standards are and how they might relate to you in your classroom and uh, give you something to think about, give you something to strive for. We're not going to uh, solve the world's problems today, but uh, just give you a start on, on how you might be uh, start integrating these things inside of your classroom and, uh, and, and kind of let you uh, go from there. Uh, I want to give you some resources, but again, this is uh, some, something that I want to uh, get through uh, in the morning as quickly as we can. Uh, that way you have as much time as you need today to uh, to put out the fires that I'm sure that you are putting out right now. So, uh, so with that in mind, let me get a copy of today's um, uh, slides. That way you can take notes on them, delete all the things that you think that I'm doing wrong, and, and uh, I'll never know about it. So there you go. Uh, so the link is in the chat, and I think I saw someone else come in. So I'm going to go ahead and share the sign-in sheet as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just like the previous weeks, uh, we're looking at, uh, again, the ISTE standards. Uh, the ISTE standards um, are, are meant to be a guide for us um, in this new digital age that we find ourselves in. Uh, they work in tandem with content standards uh, like the NCSS and the Common Core. They are not meant to replace anything. They are just meant to uh, to work alongside them, and they are meant to work uh, all the way up from national policy to uh, the things that you do inside of your classroom. Having said that, we do not want to drop everything that we're doing to teach these things, right? These are uh, just like uh, what ANED is kind of pushing for right now um, inside of our district, the, the just-in-time interventions, uh, where they are uh, they, they work hand-in-hand in hand, uh, with everything that we're doing. And I'm sorry that I probably did not give the access that you need for that, so let me fix that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And and now you should be able to to see those things. Thank you, Amy. Um, so again, we don't want to drop everything that we're doing. We want to work through uh, the the standards, uh, the ISTE standards, in a way to uh, to make it seamless. Um, what I have kind of uh, mentioned each week is uh, the the. Another thing that is a benefit to not just your students, but of yourself, uh, whenever you are teaching these ISTE standards, you are really improving your evaluation domains in quite a few different areas. And so if you are doing the things uh, that ISTE is having you do, then uh, then your, your own, uh, your own uh, you will benefit from it as well. Um, there are seven ISTE standards for students, and we, again, we are number five. So we've got uh, this one and then two more. And again, today we are looking at the computational thinker. So what is a computational thinker? Uh, to be a computational thinker, ISTE says students must be able to create and employ strategies for solving problems that use technology. And uh, students need to be familiar with data collection, data um, analysis, algorithmic thinking, um, and then uh, later on uh, machine run uh, intervention, uh, innovations, excuse me. And um, uh, computational thinking, it says, um, emphasizes efficiency above almost any other quality. And uh, uh, coming from me, I'm like, yeah, efficiency. I love, I love being efficient in everything. I will spend uh, 14 days trying to make myself efficient. That'll save me uh, 30 seconds later, uh, sadly. But uh, so maybe, maybe I'm not doing such a good job. But the idea is there, and, and that's kind of what this standard um, 
is trying to push everyone towards is uh, is thinking about ways to make yourself more efficient. Uh, so when we're talking about the computational thinking, um, um, ISTE did uh, file, uh, you know, put out a report of over over all the standards, but uh, in the in the computational thinking um, section, this was one of the. Uh, the the items that was listed and it really looks at the standards as far as how does the CS part work with math how does it work with the science and engineering and 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 where's the similarities involved you know and we see you know just things like reasoning abstractly and quantitatively you know these are the, the math practices that I've mentioned a few times over the past few weeks um, you know last week we looked at uh, at persevering and problem solving and and how do you do that first of all but but then how do you integrate that in with uh, with CS uh, and and with uh, you know the SD standards and um, you know a lot of it is just providing the students with the proper tools that they would need and I'm not talking about technology tools I'm talking about tools to solve problems and again that's kind of um, uh, you know what we're gonna look at a little bit more today and so um, I really liked this slide I, I really thought that uh, that putting it out in, in a in, in a clearly defined way was uh, uh, was it helped me kind of see well what is it that I can be doing inside you know whenever I start looking at you know math practice 8 how am I gonna hit that well can I also include some of the you know CS material um, as we go through so that I'm I'm still teaching to the standards I'm still doing the things that I need to do inside my class but I'm also hitting uh, these other areas so just like the previous weeks uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a video uh, for that, that ISD has put out real short about a minute and uh, then I'm gonna give you some resources that might go along with that standard so uh, let's go ahead and Look at this one. Students formulate problem definitions suited for technology-assisted methods, such as data analysis, abstract models, and algorithmic thinking in exploring and finding solutions. The focus was on an algorithm, so they had to design a dance move using steps. First, they get into groups of four or five, and they have to come up with a plan, so they choreograph a dance to a song, coordinate it with each other. From there, program those steps so that the robot is able to follow their choreography. There's a lot of measurement and geometry that's involved. So some of them discovered that, oh wait, a 360 is a full turn. They didn't realize that seconds was smaller than minutes or centimeters versus inches. Math is an algorithm. To them, it's like, what's an algorithm? You know, that doesn't make sense, that's abstract. But by them seeing like, oh my goodness, I just put a plan together and now I'm programming my steps into a computer and this computer is telling the robot what to do. They know what an algorithm is now. So um, we have actually, uh, we're, that's what we're gonna do today. Everyone's gonna dance. So if you could turn your cameras on and um, Steve Kerrigan was actually gonna lead us in a few things. Is that right, Steve? Just kidding, Steve. Uh, we are uh, blind leading the blind. Then, <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say, you know, talking about that specific lesson is absolutely something that, like, you could do at kindergarten. You could do all the way, you know, to a senior year to to start look just to introduce them to to what an algorithm can mean in a math class or or anywhere. Right? Is is just kind of and because the kids know know what dance moves are, they 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 probably watch TikTok, you know, all day, and um, they're probably practicing half of these things anyways, and um, and so I think it's just kind of taking that idea and then just like making it real world to them of like, oh, the steps involved in making this dance happen, oh, that's that's algorithmic thinking. I can do that. That that's no problem, and so. Um, that particular um, le uh, uh, activity actually appears right here in the code.org uh, session over, uh, they, they, they provide unplugged activities. So um, code.org um, provides, you know, an online platform to go and, and to uh, practice many of the ISTE standards, um, but they also have unplugged activities where there's no computer involved at all. And so I would recommend those things, especially right now, uh, now that we're starting to get kids back of, of you know how can we uh, how can we add in some some physical 
um, fun for them, uh, you know, in this way. And and so um, the link that and, and for each of the the pictures that I share today, if you click on that picture, you'll notice it'll also bring up a link. So if I bring up this link. Um, you can take a look at the CS Fundamentals Unplugged uh, lessons. Um, there's entire courses, but these, they've pulled out all of those unplugged lessons and put them all together. So course A, I believe, is like meant for like kindergartners. Uh, course B is, is you know, first, second grade. Um, I forget the, the grade levels of each ones, um, but you can find a, a list of those uh, somewhere here on code.org. But um, it, it breaks it down by, by grade level as well. Now, Specifically, um, specifically that particular lesson, you can get to it by going to code.org slash dance, and it will uh, give you um, an entire lesson. This is an hour of code. Uh, that uh, An entire lesson from, from that unplugged section where you can see the, uh, the kids making their dance video right here. Uh, or their their dance algorithm, um, and then it it starts adding in some of those um, actual algorithmic thinking with uh, using the computer along the way. So um, so this is a great resource. This is something that that we've done with our uh, with our son, uh, and and just uh, being able to to have them practice, you know, doing little dances using the computer, doing it unplugged, all good stuff. Any questions before I move on to the next section? All right, let's look at standard B. Students collect data or identify relevant data sets, use digital tools to analyze them, and represent data in various ways to facilitate problem solving and decision making. You are seeing students going through the process of data collection we started this process by doing some research on Parkinson's and it came across in the research that men almost two to one um, have early onset Parkinson. They're more prevalent than women. It sparked some ideas in them that they thought, well, is estrogen acting as a preventative? And so though we can't actually induce Parkinson's, but we can use a neurotoxin to try to simulate those Parkinsonian symptoms in zebrafish, which were our, our neurological model. So these were the ranges that our fish were in, and none of them had trap symptoms. Designing that experiment, being able to evaluate, you know, have I controlled all my variables? We need to be able to have results that are reproducible. I mean, that's a huge part of this process because you get into it, you think you've designed an appropriate protocol, and there are flaws. We've had some really rich conversations and um, data talks because believe me, I would leave someday with some of their questions and I'm scratching my head and I'm like, well, we have to go figure it out together. Uh, so I think each, each week um, I, I share these videos and I'm just like in awe of some of, you know, these lessons that, that are put together and uh, the importance that um, that they are bringing to the table I guess and I was showing Mandy this last night and, um, and and it was like man some of the some of the stuff we did in high school seems so unimportant you know compared to the the lessons that are that are being put forth um, by, by these teachers um, and, and I think uh, I've never done anything quite like this but I think the best lessons that um, that I've ever you know done myself, always end with me just like not knowing the answer to the questions that the kids are coming with because they're genuine questions that that you know maybe you can't prepare for that because they, they they've come uh from, from a place of, of genuine curiosity and so um, i really liked the end of that one especially because that teacher didn't know the answers didn't and and, and they were going to have to learn together as as a class and uh that's that's really awesome so um uh, you know, I'm 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 putting that in a box, I guess, and, and putting a little bow on it. Taking a look at what the standard says, you know, identifying relevant data sets. And I think the first thing to do is to understand that finding data um, can be very easy. Uh, data is everywhere, but like compiling it is is quite difficult in a lot of in a lot of ways. And so, um, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do in the past was. Um, was take place uh, in a bootstrap uh, professional development. It was uh, I spent a week in in Albuquerque uh, a few years ago, and uh, it was basically how do you teach algebra? How do you teach uh, uh, data science? 
Uh, and there was one more subject that, no, I mean, maybe it was just those two, uh, but how do you teach that using, uh, using coding? And so more specifically, uh, using the bootstrap uh, um, framework, I guess. And so um, beyond just that, one of the things that was shared during this week, and again, just like all the other images, I can click on there and uh, there's another link at the bottom. Uh, there are data sets that were shared with us that, uh, that, are, that, are, that are good to have. And so I went ahead and compiled those just in a real quick a uh, little Google Doc here that you should have access to. Yeah, I think you do. And uh, and so if I click on those, it gives me all the data for, for movies. Not all the data, but this, I believe, is the top 100 grossing uh, films. And so it's just data. It's, it's data that you can use. You don't have to worry about where it's coming from. And in fact, if you click the readme, it tells you exactly where it came from. Um, this might not be up to date anymore, but it's data that you can use that the kids can now start using as, as data science to meet many, many different things, right? You can use these really starting uh, pretty pretty low in, in, I don't know exactly the grade level, but I know that, that you know, like fifth and fourth grade, we looked at data and, uh, and uh, this might be uh, useful to you. So we have some things on movies here. Um, we have school data sets of, uh, oh, I'm not sharing these tabs, I'm sorry. Um, here is uh, school data that uh, it just looks at the school, the district, and then it starts just uh, free and lunch, uh, free and reduced lunch, American Indian. You, you can just, just a lot of data that is already put together for you uh, that you can use inside of your class. Uh, so uh, I, I thought that was really handy to have whenever I taught math, and so, uh, so, so I thought I'd put it together. Now having said that, and I think I just stopped sharing, my apologies. Having said that, uh oh, I got two different ones here. All right. Having said that, the um, we still part of it is that the students are creating this data as well, and so this is something that I had shared in a previous uh, uh, professional development. But I had created a a, a data tracking template that that you can actually kind of go and. Uh, edit yourself. It's going to ask you to. It's going to prompt you to make a copy, um, but you can edit yourself to put in your goals for your math goals for the year, your students' reading goals for the year, um, and then the students can actually go inside and input what they what they um, what they achieved during that 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 session, and. By doing it this way, um, you, the, the students can input all the information and they can create the, the graphs that, uh, that they uh, could need, you know, need to show. And it's going to, first of all, it's going to be a good data collection, again, for your, for your um, uh, walkthroughs and your observations whenever that time comes. It's going to look really, really good to have all of these compiled. Um, but it's also going to be really good for the students to be able to keep track of their own data along the way. You know, and we've seen these done. This is nothing new, right? Um, we, you know, I remember the very first uh, kindergarten parent-teacher conference that I went to, and, and they had a folder with all their data in it. This is just uh, putting that data in just a little bit different way. And uh, something that they can actually uh, keep track of um, as they go throughout their 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 schooling years. So, uh, so again, if you click on this, it will make a copy. Um, there's a couple different templates on there. Uh, once you make that copy, it's yours though. So you can completely change the numbers. You can completely change the graphs if you want. Uh, if you need help uh, creating these things, and if you're just not sure what to do with it, please reach out to us and and um, either Anita or myself, and we would be happy to uh, help you implement uh, something like this inside of your classroom. Uh, any questions before we head on to uh, C? Students break problems into component parts, extract key information, and develop descriptive models to understand complex systems or facilitate problem solving. For the projects, I want them to model their understanding of morality through a creative lens. Try to understand what is the right thing to do. How do we know what's the right thing to do? Morality is a big concept, and the project helped me find a model for morality. 
As you develop and age, you go through different stages of morality. When you're younger, you do things because you want people to see you as a nice person. In everyday life, we have to make decisions based on what we believe. And from everything I extracted from the concept, I chose Susan B. Anthony because she tried to achieve the right for women to vote, even though it was illegal at the time. So the goal is that the students are able to abstract the key ideas of the topic of moral reasoning and that it's going to look different in each project, which is fine particularly because then we get to watch all the projects and see all the different ways the students were able to extract the information and then share it back with us. Uh, so um, this is something that that is not new for sure. Uh, breaking breaking problems into component parts, breaking it into steps, and uh, and actually I'm going to uh, to show off something that Mandy has done inside of her class. I'm going to let her talk about it because um, she's the one that made it and she you know deserves the credit for it. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to her and she's going to talk about uh, uh, the way that she has done this inside of her own class. Um, so I came up with this a few years ago um, when I was trying to find a way to get my students to make some better extended responses that would be um, that would just give them a head start on a good score when they take standardized tests. And so um, we've all seen race before. It's not a new concept. Um, but one of the things that I had taken uh, from an AP training with a high school teacher was using tag. And so she did tag and then race. Um, so I just modified it just because the way I naturally would write it is genre title author um, to start off an, ex an extended response. So in the novel um, or in the play Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, then they start their extended response answer. And so once I thought about using GTA and how how to get that to stick in students' heads, um, GTA and race um, are well known for students with that particular font. Um, so if you are no a, I guess, preteen, teenager, young person, uh, GTA in that particular font is um, Grand Theft Auto, it's a very popular video game with kids. And so as soon as, you know, even within the first day of school, coming in and seeing that poster on my wall, they're already curious to know what it is. And so I tell them we're gonna use GTA in a new way. Um, so teaching them GTA race, having them have a connection to that font makes it a little more applicable to their memories. Um, and so once they learn how to pull that information from any text or any, it could be a video, it could be a movie, it could be a song, anything will help them write an extended response. And so pulling, and I think sometimes analysis of who even writes, um, who even writes a text or where it came from, what kind of genre, um, it's kind of lost sometimes because they just want to read the passage and answer the questions. So this kind of forces them to slow down. Um, you know, I have to drill it for several months before it comes naturally to them. Um, but I know Stephen has on that second or not on that next slide. And I know it might be a little bit difficult to see depending on your screen size. This was probably by the end of the first semester last year. Of course, they're not. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to teach virtually, but the drilling, you can see that this student has now mastered pulling that information. They know the genre, they know the title, the author, and they know how to restate and give textual evidence just using um, that format. And I know um, that's something that we pushed pretty hard last year in getting students to use in writing their extended responses. Um, but I know it's used widely by math teachers too. Um, just a modified version um, is usually ACE. And I know in our, I say departmentalized right now, um, our math teacher does a phenomenal job of training our students with word problems, showing them what question are they answering, what are they looking for? And that's the first thing that she shows them, she models to write down. They're gonna restate the question. Um, 
give the first part of their answer. And then when they go back and do all the work and pull the numbers that they need, then all they have to do is fill in the answer. And so just structures um, for that are really, really helpful for students to know how to extract information from what they're doing. And I think one of the things that uh, that was brought up, um, and, and I forget, I know it was attached to a training that she had attended. That if students will just do that, just they they could they could almost get nothing else um, correct about the problem. But if they can, um, st you know, state the genre, title, author, they're they're guaranteed a certain amount of points on a test. And so your test scores are going. The floor of your test scores are going to be brought up just by the fact that they are putting those things um, on their on their response. Um, so in, in this day when when we're, you know, we've got the bubble kids that are, you know, we're just, they just need a little bit more to, to make it to the next level. This could be um, the key to, to making that happen. So um, any comments? Um, I know that, again, race is not new. We, we've been doing this, you know, since, you know, for a decade, basically. Um, but uh, any comments before uh, we move on to the next piece? Okay. Students understand how automation works and use algorithmic thinking to develop a sequence of steps to create and test automated solutions. So the students, first they had to solve their math problems. So once they got their value, they had to divide that value by four and apply it to their sphere of codes in order for them to know how many blocks to move to get to the treasure. Yeah, we're doing like a block method, so like there's three things, like one's the speed, one's the second, how much you want to go, and one's the direction. They also had to know about the delay block. We had to do like a cooldown time, because if we go and tune, it's going to go on like wobbly. If they didn't position at the same spot every time, then the automated code that they had developed wasn't going to go where they wanted. So the students had to replicate the exact same process every time. I'm more interested in math, because now it's like evolved. So this algorithmic thinking is making them read the problem and slow down and actually break it into smaller, more manageable parts and applying it and finding meaning to their math. Uh, so I think uh, if you if you can get a, a student in a math class to say, like, I like math now because now it's like, now it's evolved. Now it's just, like you you get a little medal. I think they should just send everyone a medal if, if uh, one of their kids say, says that in class, right? Um, and, and just as a reminder, um, these standards again are are not meant to like every single teacher every single year has to get through them, right? Um, they're they're meant to to kind of build on each other and and uh, to to introduce little topics here and there. Um, this is a challenge. This one it would be a challenge for a lot of uh, different classes and a lot of different class types, right? Looking into automation. Um, and having things naturally occur might just not fit inside of what you um, can teach. But again, it's not up to you um, to, to, to get through every single one of these and to get your kids to master them. Um, um, so we might have to, to do some of these things like the automation uh, uh, with, with some different classes, uh, right? And so having said that, you know, there are times in class where we, we aren't... Um, um, being as uh, being pushed as hard to do, you know, to stick to a curriculum, and, and you know, just thinking about you know genius hours and just extra time that, that comes along, and and um, and I and I showed a little one of the hours of code above, and and um, I, I would uh, encourage you to to take a look at some hours of code, um, and in fact, on this link, and you kind of have to go way way to the bottom to get that link. Um, you can see uh, here's just the it's it's. Uh, uh, Voyager Elementary Technology. This is just one school that, that has put together a host of links. But again, if you go to code.org or if you go to uh, Scratch or anything like that, there are a lot of these are, are going to be available. Um, so there's different little uh, sections, and, and they're based on different grade levels. So here we have the codable, and it's you know f ages five plus, and here's Minecraft, and it's six plus, and then there's some Star Wars. Um, you know that. Uh, I'm not showing this, of course I'm not. So here we go. Here's the codables at five plus Minecraft, Star Wars, and then you know the Moana was the one that I shared. And when you click on this, it's going to start getting you a little bit closer to that automation type, right? So, um, so the students are going to be able to use this code, and it's all drag and drop. There's nothing. There's no heavy lifting, and there's nothing on your part um, that uh, that you need too much on. So there's a little intro video. Um, 
little story and uh that is probably loud right okay and uh so their goal is to make it from here to here and so we want to automate this process so when they run forward they're going to move forward but if they stop there uh, they didn't make it to where they needed to go so uh, again you don't have to be there to tell them no sweetie you missed that you know it's going to do it for you so they should move forward twice and they made it. This is the exact same thing that those kids were doing with their Sphero balls inside of class. It's just not as cool. It's not as hands-on as what they were able to do, right? Um, but that link that I provided you has a, has a host of these different activities. Um, but again, if you just if you just go to code.org or if you just do a Google search for Hour of Code, you're gonna you're gonna get a lot. A lot more. Now, I've also shared just a few other articles. Um, this is just kind of reading on your own time if you really want to to understand it a little bit better. Um, ISTE has provided uh, a few different resources as far as um, yeah, different articles on on how to develop computational thinkers, how to go deeper into this idea of man, my my students are you know they really need to to need help breaking problems down and and uh, you know. Uh, doing these things. This is uh, this is one art, a uh, couple articles that that you can uh, that you can use to kind of get some more ideas along the way. So this uh, uh, these are two that that I would recommend. So uh, it is nine thirty two. Uh, I, I my goal was to get you out of here by by nine thirty. So um, but, uh, Steve didn't do our our dance party. So uh, so I had to improvise. And whenever I improvise, it takes too long. So I apologize. Uh, I'm going to share the link. <laughs> What's that, Steve? Sorry. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Uh, you, you needed more time to prepare, I think, right? Uh, I'm going to share the the links one more time. It's the links to sign in to today's session, as well as the link to get a copy of the slide deck uh, that I shared with you today. Um, but as long as there's no other questions, I'm going to hang out if there is, uh, if there are any questions. Uh, but I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and uh, and you know please let me know if if uh, you know if Anita or I can uh, can can help you out in any way. So I hope you guys have a good one. Stephen, where did you say we um that we could get the data? The data for their goals and they could track their own that's on uh on slide number 15. okay and so whenever you click on that it's going to ask you to make a copy of the document okay uh, so i'm sharing that right there if, uh, but it'll ask you to make a copy of the document and when you make a copy then you have your own your own template and oh, okay and uh, that template again you can change everything there's there's three different uh, sheets on this um, uh, of of the the first one sheet number two uh, doesn't have any um, graphs on it. It just has a way to to input some numbers. Uh, and then the second the second tab uh, includes uh, a math and a reading um, goal for 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 one goal. And then there is a multi goal template as well that um, if you want to monitor levels of you know level you know. Yeah, level one through five. Uh, that you can you can input the the benchmark goals, I guess, uh, for each one of those for each month. And I know that we were able to find. I, I want to say I forget what grade level this is. I want to say maybe reading is correct for fifth grade or for fourth grade or something like that. I forget. Um, yeah, reading fourth. I'm not sure if we did math as well, but. Uh, we found those online, and we put in those numbers, and uh, and so our our graph is good, and so the kids can just go in and input their scores whenever that happens, and it'll it'll put it all in this uh, this graph right here. Awesome, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the one there is for ice station. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you guys, have a good day. Thank you, Amy, you have a good one too.